maybe start with a quick introduction um, with us introducing ourselves. Um, Leslie, do you want to start introducing yourself? Oh, okay, I'm Leslie Wyborn and I'm based today in you and I do work variably with the Australian Research Data Commons and also the National um, Computational Infrastructure. And I guess I just have an interest in uh, identifiers for physical objects. Okay, uh, Esther. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, my name is Esther Plomp. I'm a data steward at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. Uh, and that's mainly research support. So uh, that's a pits for researchers other than me. Um, but I, before that, I did my research uh, at the Free University of Amsterdam uh, at human teeth, looking at the isotopic composition. So that explains sort of my <laughs> favorite collectible. Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, Maggie Halstrom just noted that we should wait until 600 UTC. Um, but since the introduction wasn't actually planned as part of this presentation, I think we will just keep on talking and then get into the topic at 0600. Um, so I'm Jens Klump. I'm, I work for the CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization of Australia in, um, in the Mineral Resources Business Unit. I have been dealing with persistent identifiers and with physical objects both for a long time um, and then in all of those exercises also with the description and we will get into that um, in a minute and also before diving into the to into the presentation I don't actually want to create more suspense but I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're living and working on. And in my case, it's the um, Wajuk people of the Nunga nation in Perth and pay my respect to the elders past and present and emerging. So we are on the hour and let's dive into the topic. Describe your favorite collectible. Um, So about the session, in this session we want, oops, this is going fast. Why is this? <laughs> so you get a preview of the session. About the session, we want to explore um, how physical specimens can be made first class elements of open research infrastructures by sharing descriptions of those objects. We are avoiding the M word, metadata. And we will give you three examples of how to describe an object and then hand it over to you and he, um, hear from you what is your favorite collectible and what makes it unique and how would you describe it. And I uh, will hand over to Esther to talk about her favorite collectible. Thank you, Jens. Uh, yes, so as maybe highlighted in the introduction, uh, I have teeth as my favorite collectible. And uh, although my more recent research focused on human teeth, here we're looking at perforated dog teeth from the Caribbean, uh, which is a very special collectible in the sense uh, that it's not just a, a tooth that you're looking at uh, on the screen, uh, but they perforated the root of the tooth. And so when you find this, it's uh, not only, of course, evident that there were dogs uh, in ancient societies, uh, but also that they could have used this object uh, for another purpose. So it didn't just belong to the dog. And so uh, these perforated teeth uh, could be used as pendants. So perhaps uh, one tooth could be used as a pendant, but it could also be part of a full necklace of these teeth. And so you see a picture in the middle of the slide uh, where they basically um, yeah, used loads of uh, dog teeth together into a necklace. And so, um, yeah, you can imagine how many uh, dogs are represented in one of these necklaces. And so it's not just the tooth itself um, that represents value there in the sense that they also use this uh, as an object in exchanges, or at least so we think. 
because this is archaeology, so we don't have, uh, uh, or at least here, we don't have a written record of what uh, was going on at that time. Um, but we do have written records uh, of the Amerindian societies around the time of Columbus. And there we see uh, that artifacts such as these were also ascribed protective qualities. Um, so it wasn't just about the tooth, it was about the representation of the dog. Uh, and the dog was um, seen as a protective animal in some of these societies. So wearing that tooth could also uh, ascribe you these protective qualities. And then my favorite part about uh, these um, artifacts is actually the more boring part where we generate the numbers, um, which is the chemical analysis uh, of these objects. So we can destroy part of these teeth, uh, destroy unfortunately, and then analyze them for their chemical composition, so the isotopes uh, or the DNA. And so um, DNA has actually not uh, been published yet for dog teeth in the Caribbean, but isotopes has been a particularly um, popular topic. And then you, um, yeah, the way that that's represented it is in a sheet of numbers, so to say. So these are three quite different um, descriptions or sites of these teeth uh, that we see. And with that, I'm done with describing my collectible. Thank you very much. I, I, I find this a really fascinating example because it's not just a tooth. It depends on how you look at this tooth. It becomes a cultural artifact. It becomes maybe a magic object. It becomes a dog. It becomes isotopes, DNA, currency. Um, so there's so many ways to look at this. Can we fit this all into one description? I'll leave that question for later and um, hand to Leslie. Okay, so as you can see, I've called it a pet object. It's not a favorite object and it's a matchbox. And I want to describe it in a machine readable way so I could share knowledge of its existence and what it is. But is there an international online scheme for describing matchboxes? Hmm. No, I couldn't find one. And an online metadata schema for matchboxes? No. So let me give you a bit of background as to why I chose the matchbox. And it reminds me of showing my age. An undergraduate first year exam examination I did in the late 60s at Sydney University in mineralogy when we were given 10 objects to describe. Now, as I said, it was the mineralogy exam. Nine of them are minerals and there was a box of batches as number 10. Now, in those days, you'd smoked in labs and there was smoking everywhere. And I politely said to the um, professor, I don't smoke, why have I got a matchbox? And he said, it's part of the exam, dear. You need to describe it. And so then I, um, was a bit bamboozled, but I thought, hmm, like a mineral, it's got a 3D shape, a rectangular prism, or some people call it a cuboid. Um, it's got color, black, red, yellow. It's got dimensions, which can be expressed in either centimeters or inches. And then there are some actual descriptors on it telling me it's where it came from, um, what's inside it, and um, its brand. So in many ways, as I was stumped in this exam, I don't have a schema to describe a matchbox, but yet I know I can get um, machine readable vocabularies online that will enable me now in um, you know, 2020, perfectly describe a vocabulary of a matchbox and link to definitions of that object, of the attributes I use for my object online. Great. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, yes, yes, thanks. Yep. So um, I, I like when, when we prepared this session, I like this example because not only uh, I'm 
also have a background in geology and geology prac exams always come with this kind of practical joke of letting you describe something that doesn't fit into the schema. Um, but also um, with sometimes we need to fit things into schema, sometimes we need to recognize that the schema isn't adequate. So how can we improve on that situation? Um, my example is the uh, talking about this locomotive. It's an East German prototype, class 130, uh, of which there's, of course, a prototype, and there's a model. The model is sit sitting on the book sh bookcase across from my desk. Um, and here we can take this from the standpoint of there's a concept of a class 130 locomotive, which is expressed as a prototype and as a model. And I can describe them in, in two different ways. The prototype was built in the 60s and 70s by Luhan Seplovos in U what is now Ukraine. Back then, what was the USSR. It weighs 115 tons, it's um, almost 18 meters long, runs up to 100 kilometers an hour and has 2,000 horsepower, diesel electric, and a certain wheel arrangement. While the model was built in East Germany at uh, the scale of one in 87, it weighs 570 grams, has a length of about 20 centimeters, is powered by direct current, does not work with a digital, uh, with a digital interface, has power transmitted onto three of its six axles, couplers according to a certain standard, and illuminated headlights. Um, from the perspective of the concept of the locomotive, I'm describing two very different things. And uh, as a little historical aside, this difference between prototype and model was what got Ludwig Wittgenstein thinking about what do we want to convey when we describe something. He was thinking of a model of a car that was used in reconstructing a traffic accident in um, twen in 1914, when traffic accidents with cars were still something noteworthy to be reported in the newspaper. And um, so, here again, there's this, this, this an example of. Well, here's one concept, two very different representations and descriptions of that. So, in the preparation of the session, we thought, what do the, t t the teeth, the matchbox, and the train engine have in common? Um, and from our perspective, it, one of the things that shows what was that you can always shoehorn a description of an object into a given template. But the question is, is that really what you want to tell about that object? Is it useful in that context? Um, or is it what you really want to say? Um, so this is not only in our, relevant to our favorite collectibles, but also in a uh, science context. So I hand back to Leslie, who developed the concept of what she calls the bull's eye. OK. And so this is something that came out of our work on the international geosample number, where I was at a meeting 10 or 15 years ago. Gosh, I sound like an old, won't use the word, you know what I mean, a senior citizen. And we had like uh, ocean floor basalt people around the room, soil people, and we had um, marine sediment people, um, all geo, of course. And we're trying to work out what schema and how we would describe the samples. And right there and then at that moment, I knew it was impossible because how you describe a basalt is not how you describe a granite or, or sand. And so we came up with this model where we had an actual common kernel, which is the dark blue, and then depending on which domain you come you can pick an online vocabulary and just take that term. So everyone makes up the, their um, minimum agreed number of attributes, so to describe a cat or a dog's tooth or a batch box, etc. 
but you then just pull the vocabularies from wherever they are in space and that was what i was trying to do with the matchbox so i could get those units of measure from the codata um so it was international vocabulary on units of measure um again the shape there's another vocabulary i found the other day for shapes and of course there are international vocabularies for color and so what we're trying to say is that we're not developing a single language to describe each object but we are borrowing from languages um, the words that we need to meet agreed criteria. And then the other important thing is that, again, when you just do it on the term or the concept, you can then build um, multilingual versions of that data. And so my description of my matchbox can also be converted into multiple languages. Thanks, Jens. Thank you. So what we thought we would try and do in the remainder of this session was to play with you a game of snake and ladders. And, but then we got a bit scared of our own uh, courage and decided not to over-engineer it and just symbolize playing snake and ladders. And um, when we go into the round of you describing uh, your favorite collectible, to then look at the elements and decide, is this element something that promotes understanding of that object that would then be a ladder and move us forward? Or is this a snake, an element that stands in the way of adoption and reuse of a description schema that would set us back? Or we can decide that the element is neutral and just accept it as it is. So we would love to hear from you about your favorite collectible and maybe pop that into the chat and um, then we can um, start the discussion. And maybe if you, if you want to call you on stage and have you describe your favorite collectible and then we'll have a look at the description elements and see whether they're snakes, ladders, or neutral elements. Maybe we picked the wrong time zone. Any, anybody daring to describe something? While Shaban thinks about how to describe one of her cats. Oh, do you want to jump in? And Natasha wants to talk about fridge magnets. That's fantastic. Let's start with Shaban and Cat. Can we get Shaban on stage? Yes, yes. I've just sent uh, an invitation to Shaban. And then one to um, Natasha as well, because yeah. we'll get her up yeah. for a fridge magnet. Anyone else yes. want to volunteer? because we have to invite you in. It's a bit tricky to get you up to be able to speak. Ah, oh, look, here's Siobhan first. I'm, I'm happy to describe one of my cats. Hang on. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm sure there's one in the room. Yeah, that's, that's my, uh, my IT support. Um, it's about five <laughs> of them. Uh, he's, he's small and... Uh, uh, quadrupedal, uh, mildly fluffy. He has a bad attitude. <laughs> um, seems to run on biscuits. Um, and the outputs are very unpleasant. Um, quite warm. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure how else. He is mildly fluffy. He's not got much fur. 
Well, what, what would you say need to say when you take them to the vet? Uh, that Doesn't he's happen. male. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a desex <laughs> male jerk. <laughs> <laughs> He's not opaque. He is definitely, um, he's solid and he is a filled in space. Um, he is a mammal, if that's useful. Well, it depends. Oh, Let, let's have a quick look a at the element. So um, depending yeah. on where you go, you know, the I think to the vet saying this is a mammal is pretty straight forward but not exactly helpful but that's true what, the, what do they to know yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> what does the tooth specialist want to know yeah i, oh, I think they want to know behavioral things who knows yeah indeed maybe um whether they smell out of their mouth i guess with an yeah. infection that could happen I'm very it's, curious yeah, how yeah. he just sits right next to you and doesn't walk over the keyboards. I have to lock mine up during oh, sessions because that otherwise was... it's <laughs> early okay, yes, So I'm about to have one do it as well. <laughs> okay. But what we can already see is that there are many elements that we can use to describe cats. This, this one looked very different, but it shares common elements. Um, but not all of the elements are useful in any in, in every context. So then um, it, it seems to be very context dependent on what we want to know and need to know. Um, should we move on to Natasha and fridge magnets? Can we get Natasha on stage? Natasha should be on the way. Okay. Takes a while to get here from Brisbane. I'll get clobbered for that. Ah, hello, here she is. Ah. Hello. 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 Yes, what would you like to know? Well, do you have, describe your favourite fridge magnet. I don't have a particular favourite. Mm -hmm. So I, I have quite a lot of them. I like to collect them from different parts of the world because they remind me of where I've been. And I probably need to collect fridges to go with my magnet because <laughs> the collection is way bigger than the fridge now. Um, <laughs> so, and sometimes I collect uh, a few from a different, one different place because they're all a little different. So uh, they have different materials. So they can be made of plastic or they can be made of wood. Sometimes they're made of metal, metal or resin. Sometimes they have things added on them, like little feathers or little bits of wool or something like that. Uh, sometimes they're 3D and sometimes they're really flat. And um, but and I think a lot of the time they're also <laughs> almost all made in China, unless they're you know locally carved wood things. Um, and that's a little disappointing that you've gone to the other side of the world to pick up something that was made in China and shipped back to that part of the world. But uh, nevertheless, um, yeah. So one, of, I suppose one of my favorites. I have one from Bali, and it's outrageous because it's it's a barong, which is from their, uh, you know, a religious sort of in, in mythology areas of Bali. It's sort of a good luck symbol, but in this case, they really made it really trashy in that it's a sort of hot um, Barbie pink color. <laughs> So, <laughs> so it really is quite striking um, on the fridge to see that, um, but it reminds me of good times there. Yeah, great. So 
is there a systematic that you you already started saying though some of them are 2d some 3d color origin i guess to bring them into australia they can't be made of wood uh well, it, you, you, they can be because a lot of countries will, you can bring treated wood into some countries. If you bring it oh, in yeah. from Bali, no. Uh, but I wouldn't risk that because it will be. Yes. That's happened to me before and I paid way, way more than the actual item to get it sprayed for little bugs. Um, but you mm -hmm. can't have customs when little bugs um, actually fly out of things on the counter after they tap it. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. So but most, most of the fridge magnets you can get in because mostly they are made of plastics or resin. So in terms of a systematic description, uh, color, dimensionality, um, magnetization. Uh, yeah, the common elements would be that they, they all are magnetized, in, obviously, um, that they're all small enough to put on your fridge. And generally, mm -hmm. they are sort of half the size of your iPhone screen, roughly, but it can vary. Beyond that, all different colors and all different, some of them have photographs. As I said, some of them are 3D. And some of them are ceramic, actually. You can get ceramic fridge magnets right. as well. So I have another one from yeah. Portland um, that is uh, of the, what's he, he called? the? It's not the Unabomber. It's the Unicycler in um, in Portland um, where he wears a, a, a Darth Vader mask, wears a kilt and <laughs> rides a unicycle. And you can get a fridge magnet with him on it. So that's <laughs> on my fridge as well. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Nicole has volunteered. Unipiper, to that's it. Unipiper. Yeah, the Unipiper, yes. <laughs> yeah, he plays the bagpipes. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Um, let's call Nicole on stage. She Before volunteered to a... describe. Just a moment. Let's yeah, see. snake or ladder. I think the elements that we discussed were actually all pretty useful in describing fridge magnets. And the call should be on the way now. Oh, hi everyone. Yes. Hello. I'm really, Hello. I'm yeah, really sorry to all of you that were listening to my talk earlier that completely cut out and I've posted, I just went out and made a recording of it. Um, which I've just shared a link and I've tweeted the link as well. So if anyone Great. wants anyone wants to see it again, I've just I was either that or like completely dissolved into tears. I just decided to it again. But you don't want to hear that. This is far more exciting than retro kids. Yes. So I have Go this ahead. Sound boot, Oh, which, there I said, is. is one of my most precious possessions. And I'm not quite sure if you can read, if anyone can read that. Oh, um, it says. So that says, for those of you who can't read, that's, that says David Attenborough. So this is David Attenborough's gumboot. Um, and I all I wanted to be as a child was David Attenborough's personal assistant. And I'd still be happy if he needs someone to collect his slippers and bring him tea. I would, you know, that's my dream job. I did an honours project uh, in 1998 um, on swamp rats and bandicoots in a really special heathland just outside, um, just outside of Melbourne, but an hour, about an hour's drive away. And David Attenborough came to Melbourne for a book signing tour. And he had a two-hour window and he said, yes, I'll come. We asked him to come to this Heathland and he said, yes, I'll come, but I've only got two hours. And we were like, well, it's an hour's drive to and from Melbourne. So we spent a whole lot of our annual budget on flying him out to this place in a helicopter. And then he didn't, he'd come for a book signing tour, so he only had like fancy shoes. And so he said, we well, said it's a bit swampy. So he gave us his shoe size, which was size nine, and we went and bought him a pair of gumboots. And then we got him to sign them and we then auctioned them off at our annual meeting. And I bought one. Those of you who, knows, who know Dame Elizabeth Murdoch in Australia, she's got the other one. Um, so I've got this one um, and it's, as I said, it's size nine and I've only got one. So I said, it's a bit like a Cinderella slipper. My husband is a size nine. So I like to tell the story that I then found someone who fit my gumboot. Um, so yes, that's my, one of my very precious possessions. I should have actually brought over the photo 
of him holding it, um, which is just on the other side of my room. But anyway, I do have a photograph of him wearing the gum boots in the Heathland that I did my honours project in zoology. Um, so there you go. This is, That's my gum boot it's, story. It's amazing. It's, it's great. It's also one of those dual objects where it is an autograph and a gum boot. Yeah, well, we, it's a historical object. It is. It's a lot like the items in BHL. So in the biodiversity here, so I'm just going to take up your time because my talk died before. <laughs> we have um, two more minutes. The Biodiversity Heritage Library has all these books, but we also have books that have like annotations in them from people like Charles Darwin. So they're like books in their own right, but they're also annotation data. So yep. you can cut me. You yep. can give someone else a turn now. Shut up. They, they, no, I think I think Thanks that, so much that's for absolute, sharing, absolutely great. Um, do we still have Jens with us? I'm I'm still here. Okay, Leslie is at phone, so I yeah. guess so. <laughs> so actually, that's just our final slide. Um, but to wrap up the session, um, I think we've heard some really nice examples of collectibles here. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. I can hear you, Jens. I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, okay. fewer stuff. Hmm, okay. Well, we have one more minute, and I think um, I'll take this minute to thank everybody who participated in this session. It was great fun. Uh, it's lovely to hear about all your collectibles and your passions. And um, thank you again to um, Esther and Leslie, and also to Rowan to support us in the session. Um, and any words from you, Leslie, Esther? No, I'm fine. Okay. Well, then, thank you very much. Um, have a great Pitapalooza in the remaining hours of this conference. And we're looking forward to uh, no, so have this another. Is very rare because oh, I, I really can't hear you. Sorry, I can't seem to. <laughs> Uh, we can hear you but to unmute or, or do things i'm not sure what i did but thanks everyone so much for the session it was really wonderful thank you for sharing your favorite collectible this has been really fun thanks thanks esther thanks leslie and yen i'll now take the three of you off the stage and i'll send invitations to natasha